Spirit, come make us home. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great been faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know that you do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things oh god you do great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. Every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh God, you do great things.
scorned the death you raised him up his gains became the whole world's story let all things rise and bless your name all things made right and new again oh lord our god your goodness is free This road with every step we take, your faithfulness is our portion. You prepare the city bright and fair, whose gates forever stay open. Son of God in you. As you promised, God, your son was raised up. In him we'll follow, in him we'll all be raised up. Oh, Lord, you made yourself a home. You raise in promise your beauty arches above it all. All things once sown in weakness, you raise in promise your beauty arches above it all. pray together. King of glory, this morning we lift our own heads and our hearts, inviting you, King of glory, you, Lord strong and mighty, that you may come in, that we may rise and bless your name. All this world is yours and everything in it. We join all of creation in its praise. We seek you this morning. We seek your face, God of Jacob. The earth is yours, Russia, Ukraine, every soldier, every child watching as bombs fall. God of Jacob, as surely as you hold them all, may all things be made right and new again. The earth is yours, our relationships racked with division over COVID, division over Black Lives Matter, division over residential schools, division over politics, division over matters of faith. God of Jacob, as surely as you hold us all, may all things be made right and new again. The earth is yours. Eastern Australia enduring flash floods, Shropshire, England suffering intense flooding, United Kingdom losing more than 8 million trees to severe winter storms, our entire world experiencing a rise in extreme wildfires. God of Jacob, as surely as you hold all of these places, May all things be made right and new again. The earth is yours. The children being groomed and trafficked throughout our world. 
the poor struggling as food prices soar in places like Kenya, everywhere, the vulnerable exploited by the rich, the powerful, the greedy. God of Jacob, as surely as you hold all of your children, may all things be made right and new again. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands and pure hearts, they'll receive blessing and vindication from God their Savior. God, we thank you for the measure of justice and vindication shown this week as Ahmaud Arbery's killers were convicted on a federal hate crimes charge this week. God of Jacob, as surely as you hold the victims of senseless acts, may all things be made right and new again. We pray also for our own community. I thank you for the gifts of new life we continue to celebrate. This week we're so thankful for the safe and healthy delivery of Enola Helena Faith Penner. Thank you that Kayla is well. Thank you for the joy and gift you've given to her and Scott as well as Poppy and Corbin. Thank you for baby Charlie born to Tara. Thank you for Silas, born to Mallory and Nolan. God, we continue to lift up our many needs, trusting that you who founded our world above the chaotic seas will also give us peace in the midst of our troubled times. Be with Becca and the Master Valerios. Be with Kathleen's sister, Colleen. Be with all those in our community fighting cancer. Be with those grieving the loss of loved ones. God, we ask you to be with Ben as the ringing and pain in his ears has become unbearable. God, we ask you for healing. Be with the Keller's friend, Morris, as he recovers from his brain injury. Be with Christine's sister and brother-in-law as their mobile home has burnt down. God, be with those who are lonely. Be with those who are feeling hurt or rejected. Be with those who are bitter. God of Jacob, as surely as you will be with all of these, your children, may all things be made right and new again. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who has ascended your holy hill with clean hands and a pure heart, who on that hill and on that cross became both our blessing and our vindication. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll give you a moment to greet one another this morning so you can stand up and wave from afar or elbows or... And high fives, whatever you're comfortable with.
Good morning. Good morning. Before we get uh, to the sermon today, one of, one of our commitments here is a commitment to mission. We have it on a banner here. We, and, and we do that corporately. We do some things that we do together as a church, but, but the underlying belief is that each believer in this church has gifting and skills and a mission that God's called them to. It may be their occupation. It may be their relationship with their neighbor. But one of the things we want to do as a church is find those, help you find them, uh, help you equip, be equipped to use them. And uh, one guy that you may not know in our congregation, Rick Gosson, uh, maybe you know Rick. Uh, Rick is a consultant with nonprofits, so his mission spans a ton of things. And he's leaving sometime this week to go to work with a group um, that he's been affiliated with for a while in Israel, J.H. Israel. And I've just asked him if he'd come and share just a couple minutes about what he's going to be doing so we can pray for him and, and kind of open your eyes to the, the neat things going on all around the world. So come on up, Rick. That should be live now. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm from Balcony Church. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and, and just before I share about the project I'm going to be involved in in Israel, uh, let me just mention Ukraine very briefly. Um, last night I received a video from a, a friend who was a missionary in Ukraine and Russia for over 20 years. And he just says, my heart is breaking right now for the believers in Ukraine, for the believers in Russia. Um, I talked to someone else from Israel today, the the Israeli organizations are helping thousands of Jews get out of Ukraine right now. But for most Christians, they don't have that opportunity. So as you think of Ukraine, pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Russia. Pray against fear. Pray that they will have love and that God will keep them from hate and they'll be able to serve those around them. That was Steve's request that we pray for that. So let me tell you just momentarily about a project I'm involved in in Israel with an organization called JH Israel. And um, you can just, you can put the slide up now. This is a unique project of Christians working with Jews and being able to help shape the next generation of leaders in Israel, the youth that are coming to be leaders. Um, Joyce and I had the opportunity to be there in 2018 for almost a month. You can move to the next slide. And uh, this is from our time there, and this, this was something that was very dear to her heart. And um, I have the privilege now of going back and spending a couple of weeks there. One of the things I do is help them tell their story and to tell about what the project is about, to tell how God is using it. You can move to the next slide. The place is a, a city called Ariel, and if you see on the map there, there's a little green line, that's the West Bank. It's in the heart of the West Bank, that very disputed territory. It's the hills of Ephraim, in biblical Samaria. And in that place, God is doing some amazing things in the hearts of youth. Our purpose is really to help fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel that hearts of stone will be turned to hearts of flesh because we're helping youth to understand their biblical heritage from the Bible, from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, leaders like David, Moses, Abraham, and it's amazing to see that combined with experiential learning. Maybe we can go to the next slide. So the program is really two things. It's biblical content, teaching them about the leaders of the Bible, and experiential learning. That is actually learning by doing. Um, and you see those ropes courses. You see them in uh, climbing and uh, learning by doing. And what happens is, as they experience, and then they come down and they put that together with biblical learning, God does some amazing things in their lives. One of the things about Israel is it's a wonderful country to visit. It's great and historical, but it's a country that has 
a large number of populations that have emigrated to Israel, and many of those are, are struggling. Youth are at risk. Uh, they feel alienated. And it's amazing to see when those young people come there. They don't think that they have much to give, and God just touches their heart, and they come to trust the God of their fathers and to begin a, a spiritual journey. And if you go to the next slide, you just see pictures. You see those two guys standing on that little platform? We call that Goliath. It's a 30-foot pole that they have to climb up. They get onto this. Then they have to crawl onto this 18-inch square platform. And then they have to catch a trapeze. They have to jump out six feet out and seven feet up to catch this trapeze. Now, how many of you would love to do that? <laughs> yeah, all, all the kids. <laughs> it's great because they stand up there and they've told me, you know, I, I have to say, God, I need your help to do this. And they really integrate faith with that experience. And it's just really neat to see. And they learn to trust each other. We've had groups of Palestine, um, yeah, Palestinian, not Palestinian, but Arabic Jews and um, or Arabic uh, Israelis and Jewish kids together. And, of course, there's tremendous um, battles in their culture for that. And these kids have come to learn that, that they can trust th these people that they always thought were bad people. It's amazing just to see what God does there. So the next slide, where we are today... God has given us a unique place working with the Ministry of Education and working with the Israeli Defense Force, who send groups. We have, we have agreements with the government, with Ministry of Education, and with the IDF, and they send groups of people to be trained at this center. And we've just extended the capacity, so in a year we can host 24,000 youth, and we have programs that are being diversified. One of them is a parent-child one uh, that uh, the Ministry of Education is very excited about. Over the last 10 years, over 85,000 young people have come through this center. So it's just, uh, it's a privilege to be part of it. And um, I'm just looking forward to going. I'm looking forward to hearing the stories, helping share the stories, and come back and tell you more about what God is doing there. Thank you. God, I'll pray for Rick uh, as he goes. Let's just pray together. You can stay here. God, thanks for this opportunity that Rick has to partner with this organization. We do um, believe that, that your truth speaks, that it cultivates um, repentance and restoration in us that that your word never comes back void and we just pray that as this ministry continues to to teach these scriptures to these young people that you will shape and and mold Israel's future and the rest of the world's future God and I, I pray for all of us as we encounter our mission that you've called us to help us to lean on you and to follow wherever you lead in Jesus name amen, amen. thanks Rick Okay, uh, we're in Luke again today, Luke chapter 20. If you want to turn your passage Bible or your phone or whatever you've got. Uh, we've been working our way through our season of the Gospels, uh, looking at the story of Jesus in Luke. Next week, we kind of hit pause on the Gospels and move into the season of Lent. Um, Lent is this, this uh, period of time, and we'll talk a little bit about it in the, that, that we've, in the sermon, but we've, we've uh, adopted from church history were a period of time of, of repentance and reflection leading up to the celebration of the resurrection. Uh, there are ways we can participate together if you want. We do send out a, a weekly or a daily email through Lent uh, just with a devotional thought, a song, some things to think of. There are some practices we invite you to as a church. Uh, there'll be videos about that. If you would like to get that email and are not normally getting our emails and bulletins and things like that, just let me know, let the office know, and we'll set you up with that. Um, but after that, six or seven week period, we'll come back to Luke for, for Palm Sunday and for Resurrection Sunday. But today we are in chapter 20. And, and what I've tried to isolate as we've gone through Luke is this conflict that uh, is there, this line being drawn between the powerful and the privileged and the weak and the needy. 
and how the, the powerful and the privileged are responding to Jesus in one way and the weak and the needy are responding in another way. And today uh, we come to a parable that for, I mean, they used to say when I was growing up, don't poke the beehive, right? Don't, don't do that, right? Because, and that's what this parable does. But I, before we get to the parable, I want to look briefly at what leads up to it, just to kind of set the stage so you can feel it. So uh, what, what you need to see, we'll, we'll jump back just a little bit to, to chapter 19, uh, verse 41. Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem. Um, and, and what you need to see is the conflict is coming to a head. Things are, things are getting to the point where it's going to explode. We all know that from the story, right? But the threat of conflict between these two sides is reaching a crescendo and a peak. And, and if you look at verse 41 of chapter 19, Jesus, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace... But now it's hidden from your eyes, and the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. See, this, this at the end of the triumphal entry, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. You, you see, Jesus' sorrow at their blindness. Remember, we talked about blindness. How Jesus has come to help people see, and yet some people are resistant. And the picture here that I love about this is, is this God's sorrow over that. Like we often see God as this vindictive and angry and judgmental God that's going to teach people a lesson. But the reality that you see here is Jesus is saddened by the fact that they won't open their eyes and see, that they won't respond to the truth. He weeps over Jerusalem. And, and the future from this point on, gets really difficult. There's days of tension and conflict. The next, thing, the next story that comes is Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. And the leaders wanted to kill him. But they were afraid because it says the people hung on his word. See, that line is once again being drawn. They want to kill him. These people think he's the best thing ever. There's this undercurrent of support and love for Jesus that makes the religious elite furious. And just as we see, it, it, it often comes back to these issues of power and control. And the first part of chapter 20 that we, we won't read, but verses 1 to 8, really is the, the religious leaders coming and saying, by what authority are you doing these things? How dare you ride a donkey into Jerusalem at the Passover? You know what that means. How dare you come into the temple and turn over these things? By what authority? And Jesus says, okay, I, I'll answer me this first. John the Baptist is his baptism from God or from men? And they knew they were hooped. Because if they said it's from God, then Jesus says, well, why didn't you listen? And if they said it's from men, all the people are going to be mad because they thought John the Baptist was a prophet. So they say, we're not going to answer you. We're not, we're not going to touch that question. And Jesus says, and I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And then he tells this parable. A parable that strikes deep. I want to read it, starting in verse 9 of chapter 20. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, he rented it to some farmers, and he went away for a long time. And at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant. But that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they'll respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of this vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. And Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then what's the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. 
And the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. This this parable of the tenants in the vineyard is one of the clearest and most direct parables that Jesus ever tells. There's very little left to interpretation. He's within a, a week of dying, and this parable is one of the things, I think, that stirred the pot enough to make sure that they were going to get rid of him. It's rooted in a metaphor that doesn't hide anything. There's nothing hidden here. A man planted a vineyard, and he went away entrusting it to some far farmers. Now, the image of a vineyard, especially in the Jewish mind, was very, very common. And, and no one listening that day would not at some point have heard Isaiah 5, verse 7. Don't put that up yet, Rob. Don't put the verse yet. I want to read you 5, 1 to 6, and then I want you to, Rob's going to put up Isaiah 5, 7. Just, just listen to what Isaiah wrote. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up. He cleared it of stones. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, and he cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? Why, when I looked for good grapes, did it yield only bad? Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I'll make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. And then the kicker, verse 7. Rob can bring it up there. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in, and he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You see, when Jesus started this story, a man planted a vineyard, nobody wondered what he was talking about. That passage in Isaiah and many others have referred to Israel as the vineyard of God. It's a metaphor that wasn't hiding anything. And then the problem in the parable surfaces is the people who the owner entrusted the vineyard to, they start acting like tenants who think they are owners. That's the problem, right? They're tenants. They're put there to work the land and live there, and they've started to think they're owners. He built it. He owns it. The fruit is his, but when he sends for some, they refuse to send any back. They beat the servant who came with the request. They send him away empty-handed. They've shifted their role from tenants who are to, to care for the vineyard to where they feel like they're the owners, and this is our stuff. It's a different way of living as an owner as opposed to a tenant or a steward. They feel they have a right to the fruit. They have to protect their own interests. They've gone from taking care of something they've been entrusted with to controlling it and possessing it. Despite this, in the parable, we see a patient and very persistent owner. Verse 10, he sends a servant, right? They treat him horribly. They, they send him away empty-handed. He, he sends another with the same result, with the addition, it says, of shameful treatment. And then a third, and it says they wounded him and threw him out. And then we see a turn in verse 13. He says, my son, I'm going to send my son whom I love, perhaps. Do you hear the risk in that? Can you imagine? Just the story. Perhaps they'll respect the son. But you know they don't. And the son, the reason they don't, the laws at that time said if, if, there was no heir to a property, and the guy who owned the property died. The first people to actually live on it received the property. If there were no heirs and the owner died, the people on the property received it. So that's why they said, that's the heir. If we kill him, it'll be ours. And at this point, his patience ends in verse 15 and 16. What will he do? He'll come and kill them, and he'll give the vineyard to, uh, excuse me, to others. And just like I said, the metaphor was lost on no one. Everyone got the message. Look at the response of the people in verse 16. God forbid, other translations say, may this never be. Well, why are they upset at the owner taking vengeance on these evil servants? They're upset because they know the vineyard is Israel. Right? The story, it makes sense that the owner would come and clean house. So why would they say God forbid? Because they know he's talking about them, even the people. And in verse 19, 
You know, the, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the rulers, they knew that this parable was directed at them. Some of the parables have been very hard to follow. The disciples were scratching their head. People were like, what's he talking about? This one has been extremely clear. And Jesus drives it home with a a pointed and challenging truth in verses 16 to 19. When they're shocked by the parable, he quotes from Psalm 118 to further drive home his point. His coming will not only shake things up, it's going to reset the whole structure of reality. It's a line in the sand moment. He's confronting what he sees in these resistant leaders and many of Israel who will turn on him in the coming week because there's a refusal to understand their role. They're taking charge. They're not being people entrusted with the faith. They're people in charge of it. They're rejecting the owner. They're refusing to surrender. They're refusing to surrender to the son who's been sent. Uh, They've beaten and killed the prophets who've warned them, and now the very son of God is here, and they're going to kill him too so that they can have this all to themselves. Now, the cornerstone... um, I mean, if you're a mason, you understand that. And we, we kind of have those ideas. The cornerstone was really, really important. It, it was you typically the stone that lay, that set the direction for the rest of the building, the angles, all that, the level, everything was set with the cornerstone. And there's a, a, a legend about, the, he quotes Psalm 118, and there was a Jewish legend in that day that that phrase from Psalm 18 was reflecting a story that happened when Solomon was building the temple. Now, when Solomon built the temple, It was important to him that no masonry, no noise, no construction sound was heard on the temple site. So what he actually did was quarried the stone far away. And when we were in Israel a couple years ago, Angela and I got to go to this place. It's kind of across from what people call the garden tomb. Let's show that first picture, Rob. There's this little hole kind of in the wall of the old city, little door there. And as you walk a little closer, you can go to the second one. Uh, it, It says King Solomon's Quarries. And, and I wasn't too sure I wanted to go under Jerusalem, but it was, it was okay. Next slide. You walk down through these, through these channels, through these tunnels, and, and Solomon would actually quarry the limes, the stone used to build the, the temple underneath the city and bring it out. And the rumor was, when, from Psalm 118, that, that the guys picked out the cornerstone, the perfect stone. They sent it up. The guy looked at it and thought, that's a weird-shaped stone, and he got rid of it. And then later he said, I need the cornerstone. We need to start putting these things together. And they said, we sent it up already. So he had to go find the, the stone the builder rejected actually became the cornerstone. That was the legend around this with Solomon's temple. So Jesus, ref, he refers to that. And he's saying to, to them, you guys have tried to take control. The very thing that was supposed to set the, the stage for the new reality, the thing that was supposed to give direction to everything, you're throwing it away. And then Jesus adds his words to the psalmist down in verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. It's a hard verse. Sounds like there's a choice between being broken or crushed. Which would you prefer? (laughs) Right? They both seem painful, but you have to get the imagery here. You have to get what he's, he's driving at. He's saying that he is the cornerstone of this new reality, this kingdom of God, the way things are going to happen from here on out. And those who fall on him will be broken. Broken to be remade because all of reality is going to be different because of Jesus. Those who fall on Jesus, it's, you're going to be broken. But the breaking is this process of making you new. It's an image of the spiritual life, right? Resurrection really only comes after death. That's that's a reality. And part of the spiritual life is being broken so that you can be made whole. There's this pain that happens in life that purifies and shapes us. But for those on whom he falls, it says they will be crushed. There's no hope. Broken or crushed, when you first hear it, sounds like a no-win scenario. But with Jesus, the breaking has to do with a remaking, a rebuilding. And he's not sugarcoating it. You know, maybe you're the one feeling broken this morning. I don't want to trivialize you. Just be broken for Jesus. Yay, yay, yay. It's no fun. I'm not saying it's fun. But I'm saying it it is a part of the process. And what Jesus is saying is once you set me as the cornerstone 
in the kingdom of God, to the new reality, it may break you. But that, that's the way to being healed. If you refuse to set me as the cornerstone of reality, I'm going to set myself there and you're going to be crushed. It's not an easy message. Not one I want to make sound trite. But I, I do think we want to choose being broken over crushed any day. And, and that's why I want us to spend, as we wrap up, hearing the parable today. I want to spend time doing that. Just as it was clear to them, I think it speaks very clearly to us if we'll listen. All throughout Luke, we've realized there's a danger of people being in proximity to Jesus, really close to him, and, and yet clinging to their religious status and their power and their control and missing the whole point of what he's trying to do. You know, he says to the churches in Revelation 2.29, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I would say today, if we have ears to hear, let's listen. What is this parable saying to us, people in close proximity to Jesus? I'll give you four specifics that I'll highlight. I'm sure you'll find others. But the first has to do with choosing tenancy over ownership. The problem with the keepers of the vineyard is that they've been given something to steward as tenants, but they slid into feeling that it was theirs to take control of. The religious leaders had made faith in Yahweh all about their own status and their own power and their own control. And when Jesus started shaking things up, they felt like they were losing these things. They missed the point that they were entrusted with faith in Yahweh to steward it for the purposes of God. Same thing happens to us too. We, we very subtly move into owning our lives instead of stewarding our lives. You've heard it lots in the psalm today, Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. I, I, I heard a sermon years ago by Andy Stanley called The Myth of Ownership. And his point was, you don't own anything. Nothing belongs to us. And you're like, wait a second. I, I own a lot. No, you don't. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You've, it's been entrusted to you. Just because it's in your possession doesn't mean it's your possession. You're a tenant. And this is especially true of you and me who are believers, right? As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Not even this body belongs to me. It's been entrusted to me, but it's not mine. And we're placed here as tenants to steward God's world and our lives toward God's purposes. And far too often, we make that subtle, subtle shift to moving us to the center of the picture. We start taking on control. And with that, we take on responsibility. We feel the weight of responsibility. I've got to make this happen. I've got to protect this. I've got to take care of this. But the reality is we're, we're not owners. We're tenants here to take care of the master's purposes, seeking to reflect who he is to the world. This, this subtle shift that happens to ownership, we start protecting ourselves and what is ours. We don't want to risk. We start building our fences and our walls and we, we separate ourselves from other people. We start taking responsibility for our little piece of the world. Wait a second, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's not ours. When, when we move to owning, we have to start protecting. That's what we do. Because we're afraid of losing and, and we feel the pressure because it's up to us. And what if they don't? What if this happens? Do you see how that begins to weigh on us if we think we're an owner. And what if somebody takes us away? What if, what if, oh, what if they, they hurt me? What if, what if they do something that ruins my reputation? What if, what if I lose things that I've got? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And our, our fear, once we move to ownership, causes us to act in ways that do not reflect the owner. That's the that's the ultimate problem. 
we start trying to control situations in ways that don't reflect the character of Jesus because we feel like we have to fix it. We have to make it better. When, when in that situation, you're acting as an owner and not a tenant. We start dividing and controlling instead of sacrificing and loving and serving. Serving. Instead of realizing that the people that we're scared of, the people that we're pushing away, guess what? Are made in the image of God. And belong to him. Let me just say this really clearly, people. If the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, then I don't have to save it. I don't even have to fix it. I'm not saying we don't live in ways that are just, but I'm saying we don't take that responsibility for fixing it, for solutions on our own shoulders. Your shoulders were not made to bear those. I don't have to protect it. I don't have to fix it. I'm called to steward it, which means I reflect the character of the owner into the situation. I do what the owner would do in this situation. And to trust that ultimately he will do what's right by his, what he owns. We take on situations, we take on scenarios, we increase our worries exponentially when we see the world and our place in it as owners, as those in charge, as those who are responsible. It leads to constant fear. Instead of resting in the fact that the owner can take care of his property, he's just put me here to, to reflect his character to do what he's called me to do here. But if we can be what we're called to be stewards, those entrusted with what is God's, if we can seek to reflect him in our daily lives, we can leave the responsibility for fixing the situation to the owner. My son-in-law, is, uh, he, he's orthodox. His, his priest is a guy I really like, Michael Gillis. And this is a quote that you wrote. I think I may have read this to you before, but it's worth reading again. It's not on the screen, so you'll just have to listen. I don't want you to own this one. I want you to steward it. There we go. If history is a reliable teacher of what's to come, then we can be pretty sure of at least one thing. The world will change. Regimes come and regimes go. The church finds favor and the church loses favor in the eyes of the world. If it's not the current great reset that brings severe persecution on the church, it will probably be the next one. But whether it's here or there, now or then, doesn't really matter much we love the world and the things in the world, then any change in the world will be traumatic. If we are comfortable in the world, then an economic reset or political upheaval will evoke fear and anger. And if we are to, able to frame it as a religious war, it will evoke righteous indignation. But this world, he says, is not our home. If we are but salt and light, sojourners in a strange land, then we will adjust. We will find a way. We will carry on looking for a city whose foundations and builder is God. It's, it's, we're tenants. We're stewards. We're entrusted with the world. And yes, we, we act for justice. Yes, we're involved. But far too often I see the church feeling like if we don't fix it, it's gone. I heard that at the beginning of COVID. What's the church going to do if they can't meet? What's going to happen? The government said this, people said this a million, the government's going to shut down the church. Just let them try. It's not theirs. We can rest in the fact that God owns us, that God owns the world. Now, obviously, when we see things like Ukraine and injustice and brokenness, and right here in our own community, we want to steward where we are in ways that reflect him. So it doesn't mean we just sit back and say, it's not mine, hands off. But it means we, the responsibility for fixing it stays on God. Our responsibility is to live as a steward in the meanwhile, trusting that he can handle it. It's a hard lesson to learn. It's one that we seem to forget on a regular basis. And that's why I'm glad what we see in this story is the patient persistence of God. He's been patient with this vineyard of Israel. He's waited hundreds of years. He's sent prophets and messengers and messengers over and over, Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In the story, he makes it clear that he sends messenger. He even sends his own son, whom he loves, Jesus, the incarnation, God with us. 
That's where you see God coming and coming and coming. Reminding, 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 calling, calling, calling us to steward. He does that because we're slow learners. And you know what? Often I think we have to fail and be loved in our failure to learn not to fail. That's why God's patient. We have to often fail and be loved in our failure to be changed. I always tell my basketball team, you have to do it wrong before you can do it right. I've got kids that will never want to shoot the ball until they hit every shot. And I'm like, duh, it's never going to happen. You've got to miss a whole bunch of shots before you start hitting them. So the sooner you start shooting, the sooner you're going to get those over, the sooner you'll be able to move forward. Same thing in the spiritual life. We, we spend time dwelling on our mistakes instead of really, okay, there's grace for that, there's forgiveness, now let's just move on and let God heal that in me. He loves me despite that failure. Now I don't want to do it again. I love that patience of God in this parable, but there's also a time when that patience is done, right? What will he do with those servants? He'll, he'll kill them. And give the vineyard to somebody else. Nahum, we'll run into the minor prophets over the next few weeks, but Nahum 1.3, the Lord is slow to anger but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. There is a point where that patience ends. A point where the cornerstone will fall. And it, it, it will crush you if you're not a steward, humbly stewarding the grace that you've been given. So how can I make sure it's not me that gets crushed? Well, are you willing to hear the messengers is the question. The thing about God's patience is that he doesn't just wait it out. He reaches out to communicate over and over. He structures our lives in ways that pull the ownership tendencies right out of our hands. And that hurts because we want to hold on. And he yanks it away. The problem with these messengers is they don't look like what we'd like them to look like. Right? Often they're painful and they expose our weaknesses and our blind spots. And they make us feel as if God is far, far away when actually he's the one coming to us. Ways that he communicates to us. I, I was turning through an old journal, and I found a poem I wrote a few years ago, and I always feel a little weird sharing something like this I wrote with you, but I'm going to do it because I'm just going to leave it out there. You don't have to like it. I like it, so I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm, I'm, I'm stewarding this poem. It's not mine anyway. It feels like I've been far away, though you have never left. At least that's what you say. I can't see you or feel you or hear you. You play a mean game of hide and seek when you want to. One moment here, vibrant, touchable, overwhelming, and then invisible, gone without a trace. I want to come home. Home in a deeper way. To rest in your presence even when it feels like absence. Free me to receive the gifts you give in ways that don't resemble gifts at all. See, the messengers are often unwelcome because they unsettle us. They challenge us. They say, you're not an owner. Let it go. They leave us exposed, but they are the key to growth and to transformation. In Romans 5, Paul says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, the messengers are not just servants. They're actually our friends. They're these gifts that God has given us in ways that don't look like gifts at all. And the question is, are we going to listen to it? Are we going to receive these messengers that are coming to us and saying, let go of your tendency to take over? Steward. Reflect me into this creation and, and see, watch what I'll do. Paul's not just writing about this as a concept in 2 Corinthians. You know this story, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm a tenant, 
That's exactly what I'm supposed to be. I don't have to be an owner. I don't have to make it all work. See, these messengers remind us that this is how it's actually supposed to be. And it's hard. At times it's overwhelming. But that's why we need to welcome them. That's why we need to move into Lent this week. The thing I like about Lent is it's, it shows brokenness as a pathway to joy. It doesn't deny the fact that it's hard. It was a 40-day preparation in the early church for baptism on Resurrection Sunday. And so the, the, the candidates for baptism would, would go through a period of reflection and repentance and fasting and in, in preparation to expose their own brokenness and their weakness, to remember why it was that they needed God so much. Because when we fall on that cornerstone, it breaks us. It breaks the old us that wants to control, that wants to take power, that wants to own, the one that cannot let go of our own power and ego. But that breaking is a vital step in our renewal. Right? David, after his sin in Psalm 51, says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. I want to encourage you during the season of Lent, which starts on Wednesday, just to allow yourself to welcome the messengers, to listen to what they're saying, to humbly be broken by God, because in the grace of God, that's, that's really the only, that's where we are. You realize the owner had placed them in the vineyard. He had provided for their needs. They just refused to let it be what it was. And just like that, God has given us grace in the cross and our forgiveness. We're not going to lose that. He's placed us there as we steward it. We don't have to fear what the messengers say. Just last week, we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went to pray, right? And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We're going to close with the song after I pray. We've, we've sung it multiple times. I think most of you know it's called God's Highway. It's by a lady named Sandra McCracken. And she talks about when she was writing this song, she says, I was going through a very, very difficult time in my life, and I was trying to write my feelings out, and, and the guy helping me with the music said, you know what, maybe you need to reflect on some of those early spirituals of the slaves in the United States because what they would write was not so much their situation but their hope for what would be. And so she starts writing this song, but I want you to listen. I'm just going to read the lyrics to you now, and then we're all going to sing it together after I pray. But I want you to listen to the lyrics and think about, is this a steward or an owner? As she confesses the truth of her journey, these are words of a, of a steward. My feet are strong, my eyes are clear, she's speaking into that hope. I cannot see the way from here. But on we go. He knows the way, and in his arms he keeps me safe. Fear not, keep on, watch and pray. Walk in the light of God's highway, not ours. The shadows flee, the valleys deep. But evil cannot conquer me. Your rod and staff, they protect me. You give me rest. You give me peace. Fear not. Keep on. Watch and pray. Walk in the light of God's highway. I see the shore from troubled seas, this tiny ship that carries me. It is not yet, but it will be. So heaven come. It's you we need. Fear not. Keep on. Watch and pray. Walk in the light of God's highway. Let's pray. God, it, it is your highway. It's, it's your world. And I just pray that you could help that to sink to the very depth of our understanding that all of this is yours, that you will make it all new. And that we could assume the role that you've given to us as, as servants, as stewards, as image bearers who reflect you to creation, we want to live in ways that reflect you. But God, please, help us to, to not take it all on. Give us the grace that comes from being a steward and not an owner. Help us as we pray to entrust this to you. As we enter Lent, God, as we find these things in our own lives that are exposed, 
Help us to remember that the grace that you've given is enough, that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. My feet are strong My eyes are clear I cannot see the way from here But on we go He knows the way And in His arms He keeps me Fear not, keep on watch and pray. Walk in the light of God's highway. The shadow. top of the stone and got broken. You may have heard of him. His, his name was Peter. <laughs> he had a pretty painful process of being broken and remade. But this is what he wrote in 1 Peter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Because you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. My prayer is that you can be a tenant of the kingdom of God this week in a way that reflects the owner to the whole world. Amen. Thank you.